All right, good afternoon. Welcome to the final presentation of National Distance Learning Week for us here at SUNY Online. We are pleased to have our speaker with us today, Dr. Vikram Pagbatan. Dr. Pagbatan is an Associate Professor and Admissions Coordinator for the Occupational Therapy Program uh, at SUNY Downstate Health Sciences University and is probably going to let us know what all those other wonderful things are after his name. <laughs> we've, we've got a lot going on. We're so thrilled that you could be here and um, talk to us about the importance of digital literacy for health sciences. And I'm sure some of this is going to be applicable to other areas as well. So welcome. Thanks so much, Ash. Thank and uh, thank you for your time and consideration. And obviously, thank you to the organizers to, to really put this event together for not only the entire SUNY community, but obviously the entire national community that will be recording this and watching this a little later on. So thank you. Thank you for your time and consideration. Uh, this topic is the importance of digital literacy for the health sciences. Uh, it's a very important topic to me as a health science professor, but also just as a regular person who is consuming technology every single day. So we're going to talk a lot about the implications uh, of not only con consuming technology, but also using technology for both personal and professional means. And essentially, what does that mean to the educator? The educator who is teaching students to hopefully have those boundaries between personal and professional usage of technology. Again, my name is Vikram Patton. I'm from SUNY Downstate, which is in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, Downstate is specifically a health sciences university made up of major schools, including public health, medicine, nursing, and allied health professions. All righty, so let's just get into it, folks. And again, this is just, uh, it's a bit more of an overview of digital literacy, but I do have a few recommendations based upon research. Also some case studies that my students have conducted with me in regards to what works and what doesn't work. So hopefully this does hit home in a very practical way. There's a growing role of technology in the health sciences. All of our consumers from patients and clients, irrespective if they're seeing a nurse, a doctor, a podiatrist, a psychologist, or so forth, has access to some degree to technology. Now the question is, is that access equitable? Is that access based upon privileges? Or is that access just based upon following the bandwagon of technology usage? Essentially using technology, but not leveraging technology. So there's a revolution in the health sciences in regards to not only teaching health science students, students um, through a technology focus or technology model, but also our pedagogical changes in how we introduce technology to the developing healthcare practitioner. Uh, I'll give a quick example. Nowadays, within smart technologies, you have smart home technologies that essentially revolutionize how we interact with our personal environments. We also have wearable technologies that often tell us more about ourselves than what we know. So, for example, an iPhone, an Apple Watch, a Fitbit, and so forth. The reason why I bring this up is that health sciences students, health sciences students are close to our patient population as ever as as ever before. Essentially, they're consuming technology and using technology, but do they know their professional obligations as healthcare practitioners when it comes to technology usage? And that's the point of what the conversation is for today, the idea of digital literacy. We talk about literacy in many ways, especially when it comes to, for example, comprehension, reading, you know, expression, and so forth. But digital literacy is quite different. A quick example, um, kids, right, the pediatric population are being exposed to technology much, much sooner than ever before. Uh, some would argue that it's passive or leisure-based or entertainment-based, and I say that's perfectly fine. But if a child is able to navigate technology such as YouTube or an app or an iPad, or e essentially even understand the difference between a screen and a keyboard, they're much more literate than we think. So the idea that digital literacy is passive, I believe is refuted according to current research. Uh, the the age-old definition is that it describes the skills necessary to, to successfully navigate and use digital or electronic health information and patient resources. Now, this definition is specifically for health sciences, but the, 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 the basic definition is the navigation of both software and hardware-related technology. So that's just for everyone else. Uh, so some examples, folks, really quick when it, when it comes to health sciences students, the use of patient uh, portals or electronic patient portals, the understanding and the use of electronic medical records, the use of e-health interventions, which is now the new term to describe telehealth or telepractice, especially after the, the pandemic, uh, the integration of ethics into online practice. Can a health science student say anything they want online? <clears throat> 
so excuse me, can they say anything they want online and not essentially face the ramifications of their opinions? Meaning, are their opinions based upon their personal views or do they reflect their professional communities? And we'll talk something, we'll talk a, a little bit about something called social media competency or digital citizenship. Essentially, the burden that a healthcare practitioner who represents a, a ethical based healthcare service delivery has when it comes to upholding ethics in a digital context. Essentially, it's representing your entire profession all the time, especially when you've identified um, the profession as your primary employment area. Uh, we'll also talk about social media competency and ethical violations from health sciences students. So for example, if a student is affiliated with SUNY and they do make claims or they do uh, you know, uh, create issues, for example, of cyberbullying, does that also re reflect their professional affiliations, such as SUNY, for example? So we'll talk a lot about the little gray areas when it comes to, again, the separation between personal and professional boundaries when it comes to the online realm. Lastly, we'll just quickly mention the ever presence of artificial intelligence. It is here, uh, whether we like it or not, it is not going to go anywhere. So we might have an opportunity now to really get ahead of it when it comes to the way that we kind of enforce our own instructional techniques as professors and educators and members of the higher education community, but also not reinforcing it negatively, if that makes sense. If it's going to be used, let's figure out how it can be used ethically and morally, right, when it comes to the idea of education. So why am I talking about specifically digital literacy in the health sciences? Again, uh, I've come to realize that access isn't um, there. Access isn't equitable. A quick little perception is that during the pandemic, we just assumed that all of our students had access to a laptop or had access to Wi-Fi. Unfortunately, when it comes to New York City, for example, that was not um that was not a fact whatsoever. So the idea is that does your do are we teaching health science students to look at patients and consumers from an unbiased perspective? The idea is that should everyone have a smartphone? Should everyone have access to Wi-Fi? How about this? Is technology more for independent usage or sometimes could it be for shared usage? Uh, the reason why I say that is that a lot of students found during clinical rotations in 2020 and 2021 is that an entire family was just using one single device for multiple purposes. Uh, the bandwidth is obviously limited when it comes to that. So again, access is not equitable. <clears throat> one must ask. Uh, evaluating online health information. Folks, there's a lot of stuff that you can just quickly Google. And a lot of our health sciences students can easily find something on Google or a search engine versus a primary or secondary source, meaning an, a, a credible source like a textbook or an article. So are we training students to critique what is found online or should they just believe anything that comes up from a Google search? Again, folks, it's a little scary, but if that's the case, then they're not so far off from the consumer population, right? Even though they're healthcare practitioners or developing healthcare uh, leaders. Uh, intellectual property and plagiarism, uh, now more than ever, uh, there is a lot of cut and paste when it comes to borrowing others' intellectual property, especially when it's readily available, for example, through artificial intelligence or through other multiple platforms. So are we, as health science uh, professors, enforcing the translation of plagiarism into the health, uh, into the digital context? That's something that we need to probably catch up on, especially with current research of multiple ethical violations for plagiarism uh, from health sciences students, <laughs> according to research. Uh, last thing, digital footprint and digital learning. Uh, health sciences can be quite difficult to teach online, especially when there's a hands-on or experiential component. However, we did learn from lessons from learned from the pandemic that it is possible with new technology that is ever, ever so simulation based. So I'll bring up a quick example of how digital literacy and simulation training are highly correlated. And that might be the new wave of teaching students more efficiently and also meeting them halfway based upon cultural and generational preferences. Uh, let's just face it, a lot of students prefer to be online. And, a lot, and there are a you know, small minority that still want that hands-on approach. But if it's possible to have a little mixture of both, that might be the, the, the solution to a lot of issues. All right, so I'm gonna talk about two populations just to give you quick examples, because this is how we do teach digital literacy when it comes to health sciences. Uh, again, we talked about kids and pediatric populations that are having access to technology. 
what are the developmental effects of this technology? Some argue that is an increase in learning disabilities based upon having information too readily available that is often multi-sensory, meaning it's always on, it's always loud, and it's always there. So research does, does state that health sciences practitioners must be cognizant, not only of enforcing um, boundaries or structured limits to technology usage, but also understand parenting styles and cultural preferences and also social determinants of health. Uh, technology and pediatric development is there, meaning it's it's quite closely knit. So from a negative reinforcement to a positive reinforcement, if technology is there, should we focus on educating parents and caregivers from a digital literacy component as opposed to saying no? don't give them technology or no, you're giving them too much. Uh, I'll give you a quick, a quick case study where students have found that the latter education and a more collaborative approach works much more efficiently than just mentioning all the bad things that can happen with technology addic addiction or often social media addiction. Uh, and the reason why I bring up the pediatric population is that I'm about to bring up the geriatric population, because again, those are the two spectrums from, from a binary perspective of who we serve as health sciences uh, educators. <clears throat> There's a digital divide, according to research, when it comes to older adults. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, many individuals often have two categories, either you're a digital native or a digital migrant. Somebody that is someone that is forced to adapt and assimilate to technological advances and differences can be, can be considered to be a digital migrant. Uh, you didn't grow up with it, but you now have to use it. There's also a digital native, much more closer to, to the generation that is Gen Z, for example, or millennials, that often have grown up with technology usage and see it as a part of their health and wellness. Uh, again, understanding that they have symptoms, they can quickly just do a Google search. Understanding that they need an appointment, they can go online and and uh, book the next scheduled appointment with an urgent care provider or so forth. These are, in many cases, according to research and my own experiences, privileges that many older adults don't have. So there is a digital divide that educators have to realize when teaching about digital literacy to health science students. Uh, there can't be an assumption that everything is done efficiently or with ease or with access. I bring up specifics about online banking, online shopping, online medication management, online health management portals and data decoding, meaning understanding that you have to have an email, most likely, to sign up for a health portal. Um, I, I've trained PA students and medical students to ask, simply just start off with a conversation. Do you have an email? Do you remember the password? <laughs> Do you know how to reset the password? These three simple these three simple questions can often build a, a huge rapport and level of trust when it comes to someone feeling comfortable to disclose that they just need a little bit of help when it comes to accessing or setting up their portals. Lastly, do older adults understand that their privacy is technically so-so when it comes to online information. So uh, again, protecting or ensuring that the, the patient or the consumer is just as accountable for their own privacy, especially when it comes to HIPAA compliance of their information and not you know easily uh, spreading their information across online platforms. So I do believe that every healthcare practitioner uh, from a health sciences perspective is accountable to ask these important questions. If we don't teach our students to ask these important questions, we're just increasing the social disparities and technological disparities that exist often within communities. All right, uh, there are multiple, sorry, let me just move my screen. So there's a path forward. And I wanna bring up one quick example that is not from SUNY, but again, from a national uh, national entity, that's the AARP. And they're a, they're a great resource, I gotta say, that is quite free and I um, free and also, they're constantly updating and um, thinking about the more practical perspective of their in content information. Now, this is not an endorsement of AARP, but I have my students often critique a lot of initiatives, you know, whether for profits, non for profits, and so forth. And they found that the AARP has a really seamless approach to teaching technology, technology literacy, digital literacy to both parents, older adults and many marginalized communities, meaning individual disabilities, individuals that are homebound or that have limited resources. So I encourage all individuals to not just look at the AARP, but also look at other entities that are tried and true 
and don't really much they don't really have a stake in the game meaning it's essentially just to convey and increase knowledge uh for example i i was a little as a new yorker i'm a little skeptical i thought they were going to ask for a sign up but no everything's available through multiple libraries of online information for free So I have all my students during their clinical rotations recommend the AARP as a source that someone can quickly access on their phones, just as a starting point, again, because everything is sometimes through technology. All right. This is an example. I'm getting uh, a little bit more, a little bit more halfway toward the presentation. This is an example of a case study that I present to PT, OT, nursing, and medical students. Uh, this case study is about an individual who has suffered uh, three CVAs, or three strokes. Uh, she is following up with her primary care physician, and essentially the primary care physician is asking her to follow up with a neurologist, but she doesn't have an email and she cannot access her health portal. Because of this, of this issue, she actually had to wait four months to see a follow-up uh, physician based upon her, her frequent strokes or unfortunately her de deteriorating status. That, that led to multiple comorbidities and other issues happening in that four-month time span. That also led to a level of distrust when it comes to feeling comfortable conveying the need for help. Uh, I bring up this case studies for a reason because this is how I teach students to not only develop and build empathy, but to understand that their soft skills are just as crucial as their medical skills. Doesn't make doesn't really matter if you're a great practitioner. It is important to remember that you're a human. And you know that one statement that most students say when they choose when they choose health sciences, they want to help people. Well, you know, put your money where your mouth is and 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 ask a question first that it sounds more humanistic. So I bring up this case study because this was a patient in one of the hospitals in Brooklyn uh, from one of my students. And uh, yeah, uh, unfortunately, after hearing about the four month delay in accessing a physician, uh, she established a program, a, a free program in, in cooperation with a startup in New York City to develop a tutorial on how to access online portals. Um, so again, as a part of a capstone or as a part of a community-based project, it's a free it's a free app that's available through the app market for Apple and Android, I believe. And again, it's quite seamless. So again, seeing a problem, finding a solution, being accountable, I believe is is everything in, in regard to health sciences across the board. All right, coming back to parents, uh, parents and caregivers. Uh, there is a little bit of an issue when it comes to digital literacy. Um, according to research, there is a push towards reinforcing learning through online applications. A quick quick example from my pediatric physical therapist and speech therapist is that a lot of parents are encouraged by educators to use apps, apps for math, apps for social studies, apps for you know learning uh, languages or sorry, uh, uh, comprehension of certain words or increasing vocabularies. And that's perfectly fine. From a health sciences perspective, um, if there is going to be a correlation between learning and technology, then it is just as much as a responsibility of the school-based providers, for example, the nurse, the physical therapist, the school psychologist, the occupational therapist, to ensure that technology is a part of the child's IEP, which essentially means an individualized education plan. In the health sciences in New York City, for example, there is a large public school system called the Department of Education for New York City. Uh, a lot of our students are saying that technology is being used, it's being encouraged, but it's not being documented. And I said that for a quick example as a case study. If it's not being documented, then there is not a fair allocation of resources and time and often follow-ups when it comes to technology usage. So I say this that in many cases, the ed tech specialist is a great resource when it comes to school systems for understanding technology usage to reinforce curricular outcomes. However, for the healthcare practitioners, if you have not learned about technology usage when it comes to ed tech, you may not be, you may be breaching your scope of practice. And I say that this might, this might be an ethical violation where you're giving your two cents from a personal perspective, but not from a professional perspective. And I say that kind of, you know, emotionally, because again, as a parent, I wouldn't want um, my child to in essentially have, you know, a, a supplement to the learning that is not evidence-based or from a practitioner or a person who whose specialization is technology. 
I'd really rather go to the source to ensure that whatever they're doing is tried and true. So again, uh, the idea for parents is that, again, accessibility doesn't mean that it's always great for learning or pediatric development. This is another case study that I want to bring up when it comes to teaching um, health sciences um, students about the differences between hardware and software. Uh, there's an understanding that, yes, you have a fancy tablet or a fancy computer or a very expensive iPhone, but software is just as critical as hardware, especially when it comes to the differences in health promotion and preventative medicine as well. So there are multiple apps available now. Uh, these apps can do a lot of different things for you when it comes to productivity and so forth. Have we vetted them as health sciences educators or health sciences practitioners who are developing these apps? Have these apps gone through trials of research, whether randomized control or just any type of valid research? My point is, there seems to be an evolution um, or, a, or a huge transformation of how many apps are developed on a daily basis. But I find my students often having blurry boundaries between what they find useful versus what they should professionally recommend. And again, I mentioned hardware and software because both are critically important for technology to work. You can't have one without the other. So if it's something that we need to reinforce in the curriculum, then we might also need to have continuing education, maybe even seek out an interprofessional approach to having ed tech um, leaders and, and researchers teach our students. Uh, I don't think it should just be in the hands of a, of a single discipline, for example, medicine or nursing. Uh, in SUNY, we definitely do pride ourselves in interprofessional education, sometimes even intraprofessional education. It's the most well-rounded way to teach students to be the best that they can be. So I do think that if we don't know something, it's okay, but we should seek out um, you know, non, a non-siloed approach to ensuring that students are well-rounded. All right, so uh, according, according to research, there is um, there's a little bit of an issue when it comes to the idea of procurement, infrastructure, and advocacy. Uh, technology is great. Uh, and if you're going to reinforce technology usage in practice, in health sciences practice, who's going to pay for it? <laughs> uh, who's going to upkeep it? Who's going to maintain it? Who's going to update it when it needs to be updated? Uh, as healthcare practitioners, we have to be quite practical. If insurance doesn't cover it, if it's not under Medicare, Medicaid guidelines, if the individual isn't able to procure technology on their own, meaning out of pocket, then it shouldn't be mentioned. And I say that because, again, it just reinforces the idea of disparities, having access versus not having access. So there is something called an occupational profile within the OT profession. This is essentially a screening method to ask those critical questions to all parties, uh, a child, a parent, a caregiver, a spouse, or, or even a, a, another professional, uh, essentially as a technology screen. Uh, I can post the link, um, or if you just email me towards the end, I can give you a link that has multiple resources and evidence-based uh, research articles. But this is an open PDF to anyone who wants to use it as a means of getting a full picture of, how, of what role technology plays in someone's life from a health perspective. All right. Um, and yep, I mentioned the medical model and the social model of, of health sciences practice. And now we're entering a technology model, especially with something called telehealth. Um, I'd like to bring up telehealth for a quick second. In 2020, 2021, most individuals who were traditionally teaching in person, for example, at Downstate, when switching to a fully synchronous or asynchronous format, we had no idea what we were doing, to be quite honest. We were ensuring that we were trying to employ best practices and, again, moving the curriculum forward as much as possible. But telehealth or video conferencing tools were pretty much new to most practitioners, especially if it wasn't used clinically, meaning if a doctor or a nurse or therapist wasn't using it professionally, it would be pretty hard to say that we would we are proficient in using it academically as educators. And I say that for a quick for for a point. Seek out continuing education, seek out mentorship, build communities uh, of shared values and shared interests around technology, but don't stop learning. 
Um, I think the pandemic was a humble reminder that when forced to, we can adapt. Um, but looking back, there were, there were much areas of improvement, right? There were a lot of mistakes that happened and that's perfectly fine. So the digital divide is not just for the consumers of technology. I would say that it's even for educators of technology. Uh, essentially, just don't be static when it comes to ensuring that you're, you're looking at technology from all perspectives. All right, so for higher education, just in summary, um, technology literacy or digital literacy is within admissions. It's, it is within our pedagogical approaches. It is understanding student supports and student outcomes, meaning what metrics or what data are we using to say that technology is integrated in our curriculum. A quick example is that, for example, an LMS, a learning management system, um, you know, we, we often just assumed that individuals from a grad perspective, had undergrad exposure to various LMS, uh, uh, learning management systems. We often didn't think about, hey, should we build a tutorial to ensure that an incoming student uh, who's using a specific learning management system feels confident, feels proficient, is able to navigate it quite well. So those were great lessons learned from the pandemic. Again, understanding that you just can't assume that technology usage is equitable. Last thing, technology usage and digital literacy is critical for health sciences students to understand reimbursement. There's a lot of opportunities to commit fraud. There's a lot of opportunities to have ethical violations. Uh, digital literacy ensures that students are not only ethical, but are following their scopes of practice. Uh, it is quite easy to have blurry lines between what a psychologist does versus a psychiatrist. I get it that their scopes of practice, their scopes and licensures are different, but in the online context, it, it's a little difficult to distinguish both, especially when both are, for example, in play when it comes to a situation that involves a patient or a consumer. So my point is just educating students about boundaries, uh, reimbursement policies, and how policies impact not only traditional practice, but online practice is going to be critical to move forward to ensure that students are well-rounded. Uh, these are some just specific strategies that um, we found that work, um, for example, at Downstate and uh, on, often in Stony Brook as well, which is another SUNY campus in Long Island, New York. Information evaluation skills, do students understand the research that they're they're basically finding online? It's one thing to train students to find valuable research. It's another thing to train students to find false research or essentially fact-checking information online. Essentially, students have to be active, active critics of everything that they see online uh, with the lens that their consumers are also finding similar information. So again, uh, as, as the front line of data when it comes to health sciences, educators and students have to ensure that they're accountable to, to use relevant information that's been tried and true. Uh, another recommendation would be to understand navigating online health platforms. Um, students are using different portals for documentation. For example, in New York, there is a large um, uh, city hospital health service, or sometimes we call it Presbyterian or Northwell, just based upon private entities. My point is that students should be able to transfer what they've learned, the skills and competencies, in through one digital platform to another essentially, hope, hopefully, hopefully that the core skills are the same, right? So in, in preparing, students is, preparing students in the educational realm to understand the core competencies that could be transferred is critical. Uh, you don't want a student to say, I wasn't exposed to this. I'm not sure what this is. Um, that's okay, but it doesn't go far when it comes to accountability. So again, just making sure that we are up to date when it comes to what we do in the classroom is going to be just as critical. Uh, lastly, uh, ethical considerations. Uh, as I said before, there's something called social media competency. It was developed by Albers in 1999, this term, where students um, need to be checked when it comes to their online behaviors, especially when confirming affiliations to institutions or confirming affiliations to a professional identity. For example, nurses, doctors, therapists, and so forth. Uh, the reason why I say it's social media competency is that because it is a competency. It's an uh, it's a lifelong practice. It's not essentially gaining competency, but it's ongoing competency. So a quick example is that we reinforce the health sciences students that they have to have a separation between their personal identities online and their professional identities online. That's going to be critical for not only just PR perspective, but in to in ensure that if patients and consumers are searching 
their healthcare providers online that they see what they should be seeing, if that makes sense. Nowadays, a lot of attitudes and perspectives and biases and judgments can be formed by consumers if they don't see the correct information online. I keep on mentioning that because we often forget that everything we do leaves a footprint. Uh, so for students, especially the younger younger generation of students, just have to be reminded that everything does have a receipt when it comes to activities. All right, this is just research, um, again, based upon uh, the, the peer research, also based upon certain studies. And have, I have a um, reference list at the end. I'm going to come down to that for a quick second. And I just want to mention this last slide. So whether you're health sciences folks or you're uh, um, a, a different discipline or professional when it comes to being an educator, for example, uh, it's important to champion, foster, and lead uh, the ideals that you want when it comes to whatever we teach students. Uh, one thing that I want to mention that has worked for me is modeling. If I'm saying it, then I am just as accountable to lead by action. So if you, you know, for example, if I say Google my name, I'm just as accountable for what comes up as someone else when it comes to what we say in the classroom. Uh, I think it's quite critical for educators to be reminded that we're constantly being modeled, sometimes in good ways, sometimes in bad ways, but we are we are essentially models of practice in in the health sciences perspective, that's what we call it. If a PA is teaching about certain techniques, um, a PA is then the model that the student will strive to be or to practice as. Um, so again, from a behavioral perspective, just realize that imitation is happening all the time. So model the actions, model the behaviors, model the practices that you want future students to uphold. Alrighty. Uh, and yep. That's those are just some of the references, and that's my email. I have a full reference list available on an open Google Doc. Simply just email me, and I'll give you access to the Google Doc with the DOIs and, and the links. That's terrific. Thank you for um, making those resources available to people who are interested. I did put your um, your email in the chat, so folks could grab okay, that okay. if they are interested in doing so. Um, I am not at all. Um, I have no background in health sciences. <laughs> it's exclusively education, um, but it is in technology. And I am a parent of, um, well, I guess my youngest is a millennial, right? And then they go on up from there. So um, it's yeah. been really interesting for me to see the impact of technology in health services. And as my children have become adults, who now need to manage their own care and mom doesn't have to do it for them, right? right. They're right. making their own appointments. They're using my chart. They're doing all of this stuff. Um, it's been really interesting to see what healthcare providers tell them about sure. like how to access and how to search for things about their own health um, that, that were not anything that would, would have been recommended to me at that time, you know? Um, oh, interesting. Interesting. It's <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's really changed. And yeah. I like yeah. the one statement that you had on one of your slides when you were talking about, um, <clears throat> the more senior population, that connectivity is not connection. And right. that is just so true. Right. Um, one of my, um, side gigs, I guess, is to, uh, I, I volunteer at our library, through a program um, with the County Office of the Aging to teach oh, technology oh. to seniors, right? And so it um, one of the ones that they had asked where they surveyed them about what do you wanna learn about? And there's the usual social media stuff or how to use Netflix or that kind of thing. But the other popular one was um, health and wellness apps. And they were really interested in learning about what are some you know, quality apps that are out there and then how do they use them and how can they help them live a better life? So I thought it was yeah. interesting that, that that came about too. Yeah, no, I, mean, I, think, I, mean, I think again, anything at the community-based perspective or even at the the, the front line of, of just, you know, having these conversations, um, especially to individuals that it may, may not know who to turn to. Like, how, how do you mm -hmm. know who to turn to when you say, I, I'm having a hard time downloading an app? Sure. I, I just I just found so many uh, missed opportunities, right? When it comes to patient care or consumer mm -hmm. care, uh, just like you know, do you, do you bother the primary care physician, the one you can't see for a couple of months because they're all <laughs> looked up, or you know, like again, these are uh, these are things that we might just want to you know have in as conversations in the classroom to kind of shed some light for the future, right? Healthcare leaders. Sure. So I'd love yeah. to hear other perspectives. If anyone has questions or comments. Um, or Dr. Peg Patton, anything else? 
I did see some comments in the chat, but. Um, I didn't think of it at the time. Oh, go ahead, Lisa. No, go ahead, Ron. Oh, I was just going to say, I didn't think of it at the time, but in my personal life, I have an elderly parent who just was um, going through this where she was in a hospital setting and they were talking about insulin and pumps. Mm -hmm. And uh, the nurses in the hospital setting were saying um, that pumps might not be covered by Medicare or, you know, insurances and stuff like that. And so the older person that I know, that's what stuck in her brain. And then like a couple of weeks later at her primary care physician, um, she was saying, oh, I probably won't qualify. The nurses said that it's hard to qualify for the insulin pumps. And at that practice, the person said, oh, if we need to get you qualified, we can find a way. And so I thought, wow, at, it didn't strike me until you were just saying that in an educational perspective, that could be important. Uh, I think maybe older generations tend to um, information sticks with them than maybe yeah. like younger well, generations yeah. where they just kind of take the most recent thing they've heard. Right. Um, to this day, that person is like, well, I don't know if it would be covered. And I'm like, you know, that's the danger in exactly what you said, not being trained about something like this, or, like yeah, technology. Yeah. And yeah. No, no, th th thank you for sharing. I'm sorry. I mean, thank you for sharing that. But it, it could also mean life and death where uh, that, that sometimes that over transparency of, of conveying information that you probably are not um, fully competent in conveying could make a drastic difference in someone's health and wellness. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it's uh, I, I find that older adults take the word of subject matter specialists to the T. Right. If a doctor says this, and the therapist says that the nurse said this, they must know what they're doing. Correct. I mean, again, it's just a perception where it's it's it must be well-rounded and well-developed before they say something. So I just want to. So, yeah, to your point, so make sure that students are not um, overstepping. Right. In many cases, by making determinations that they shouldn't be making. Yeah, but that, thanks for sharing that. Um, I'm Lisa Boyle. I teach uh, in the Health Information Management Program uh, at Alfred State College. So okay. one of the courses that I teach is electronic health record management. Okay. Um, and then I teach a quality and legal. I In my quality and legal, I have a, a newer assignment on health literacy. So this was really interesting to me. Um, I give them they read information about health literacy in their textbook and then I um, have them do a little research. And so they're trying to look at, um, you know, who um, is most common in having uh, the problems with health literacy. And so they have to, so they're doing some investigation into this. And I sure. kind of relate it to the patient portal a little bit because with consumer um, informatics and be working in this health information management, they're going to be dealing with with patients that are trying to access the portal. But I do notice when they're doing the literacy, and what I do is I give them a copy of real discharge instructions, and they're supposed to compare it to what what a patient would be looking at and, and what oh, right, are right. sort of the requirements. So they do sometimes capture that digital aspect, like, um, you know, what if they don't know how to use the patient portal or things like that, if, if this is, you know, the discharge instructions are referenced in it. Um, but I, I think I need to try to get them to look more at not just paper aspect of health literacy from what they're given discharge instructions, but also, like you mentioned, without the patient portal and all of that other kind of stuff and um, not yeah. having an email address to even sign up for the patient portal and things like right. that. So right. That, yeah. That it's really interesting yeah. to me. Yeah, and 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 to your point, I'm sorry, but yeah, it, it's almost like um, are they also evaluating the the prerequisites, right? The the executive skills, the cognitive yeah. skills, even navigational skills of understanding. Like I, I, it's just um, I don't know if it if it should be like a secondary um response to any recommendation that has to do with technology that someone gets flagged or right or alerted to ensure that the person does have access, meaning. I, I, my, a lot of my students tell me that there is relatively no follow-up, right? When it comes to what you recommend, if it has a technology focus to then the next time that a person sees a provider, like, right. I, I just, I, I don't know, maybe it's just soft skills, maybe it's just good practice or best practice, but we, we, we again, maybe if we just have these conversations in class, hopefully, right, the insight mm -hmm. of insight develops 
for the, the, the next gen? I think they don't, like I'm older so, and I have an elderly mom. And so I have to help her with some of this, but I think some of these younger students that we have, like their parents have email addresses, they know how to do it, but so they don't maybe have that concept of somebody not having an email address. You know what I mean? They've never been yeah. around somebody yeah. in that generation that wouldn't have an email address. So to them, they don't even consider it as being yeah. an issue, maybe. Right. That's the only thing I can think of sometimes. No, well said, well said. Yeah, I mean, it's a huge migration of, of everyone becoming a digital native, right? Everyone right. everyone is now, at this point, um, exposed <laughs> to, to technology in some form. So yeah, I, I get. I had a, I had, a, I had a quick slide of like a typewriter and a beeper. I just I thought that was a funny thing to put up in the beginning, but I'm like, hey, does anyone does anyone know what these are? What they, <laughs> but, yes. Yeah, just little things. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's. I like to give my experience as an instructor because when I started in the field over 20 years ago, well, more than that now than I was in the hospitals, we didn't have electronic health record. Like, so I'm trying to explain to them. When we kept track of patient visits, we had these little four by six cards. They were called master patient index cards, you know, so I'm trying to show them the progression. But yeah, I don't know if sometimes they can get that fully, um, you know, but it's but it's always interesting for yeah. them to see what we did before we had an electronic health record. So. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Th thank you for sharing, Lisa. Yeah. I, I just think as you and Lisa were talking, some of the older population, um, I don't know if there's statistics on this, but I have seen it anecdotally. Um, you know, you take an, a person who's 60 or 70 or plus, and they were maybe like a teacher or a doctor or a lawyer or something. Uh, I've seen where they're embarrassed to admit that they don't like know how to navigate email. Um sure. And I've, I've seen people that, you know, like they can do Facebook, but they don't, still they're not digitally literate in terms of like email and portals and stuff like that. Um, so now that's interesting thought as well for educators to. Absolutely. Yeah. And also, Ron, I, I know um, Vikram mentioned the security issue and privacy issue. One of the things I noticed in working with the senior population on these um, these sorts of trainings for technology is that they um, are either super concerned about the information yeah. that's out there if they participate in the technology, or they're completely unaware. And, and when they find out, they're super concerned. <laughs> but they're, it's, yeah. it's either or. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I agree with that. They're either scared to death of anything yeah. that involves their name on a screen, or they're sending money to... Um, people that uh, need a bank a account. Prince, a prince yeah, the prince. Up, yeah. I couldn't remember the yeah. country, the original one. Naturally, yeah. 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 I would just say that I really appreciated uh, the content of the presentation. We don't always get really specific health sciences or health related presentation. So um, actually, Lisa and Ron are both my colleagues at Alfred State, and I also teach in the health information program there. Oh, very cool. Um, okay. And I, I think um, one of the things that I have to remind myself every semester is that I can't assume that our students all have the same digital literacy when they come into the, into the, you know, into the program, into the curriculum. Um, and so it, you know, it can start even sooner with us talking about how they need to be uh, literate to be successful as a student and then how that translates then into their career path and health information where they have to, you know, really level that up. So um, right. I just really appreciated the, the content and reminders today. So there's a lot that I get to, to take back from this. Oh, thanks, Erica. No, I appreciate that. Yeah. I, again, it's, it's a, it's a novel topic for us in, 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 in downstate where we're just finding a lot of gaps Right, we're just trying to figure out where these gaps are stemming from, as as we should, especially as accountable educators. So again, everyone is striving to race to become something—a nurse, a doctor, a therapist, and so forth. But they have to sometimes slow down and realize how diverse their populations could be, right? Their patient populations. So yeah, no, thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, just trying to figure things out. <laughs> That's all it is. Well, thank you, everyone. Really appreciate your um, attention. And I'm so glad that it um, was very useful for all of you. When I saw this proposal come through, I thought about, you know, our um, our health schools and, and 
we don't often have a lot of presentations like this. So I really appreciate Vikram from you as well to be able to share what you're learning along the way as you teach these students. So thanks, Sarah. Um, Again, th thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, it's a it's, it's, it's to be in the mix. Yep. And that concludes National Distance Learning Week for us here at SUNY Online. So we're really happy that all of you could participate. And I wish you a wonderful rest of your semester.